I'm so happy to be here. Uh, Bill has been teaching us so well on incarnation. And uh, I'm delighted to talk about it. I've been uh, so happy about it that I don't know how well I'll do communicating it. But I want to talk to you about incarnation and celebration. Now, you have a sheet in your bulletin, and it says more or less what I will say to you. So here goes. I'm going to say it. But it's about inspiration. It's about adoration. It's about seeing the greatness of Jesus. And I love the little baby, but the little baby is just the beginning of the incarnation. And maybe actually the beginning was nine months before that, I guess. Uh, But the incarnation is a cosmic event. It touches the whole universe. Uh, Incarnation is about Christ coming into the world of matter. Flesh, matter, generally. The reconciliation that is spoken of there is a wonderful, ravishing thing. And uh, I love uh, 1 Peter 1.8. And 1 Peter 1.8 is addressed to the pilgrims and scattered strangers, it calls them, in the opening of the book. And primarily in the cities around northern Turkey, what we call Turkey today, and eastern Turkey. Well, actually the whole thing, Cappadocia is on the other end. Uh, so it's addressing these pilgrims. And these pilgrims uh, were suffering in many cases and did not have an easy life. Uh, But uh, Peter is talking to them about the faith that they have. And in 1 Peter 1.8, he says, though you haven't seen him, you love him. And though you haven't seen him, you believe. And you are, this, this phrase is so wonderful when you understand what they were believing in. You are filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. And uh, the old uh, hymn, you may know, joy unspeakable and full of glory, has the phrase, the half has never yet been told, added on to that. And uh, I want to try to tell a little bit more of that here today and help us come to an appreciation uh, it's, a, it's a topic that causes people a lot of trouble, both believers and unbelievers, because they try to figure out what, how, how could this be? How could humanity and divinity be combined in one person? Uh, how could someone be God and be man at the same time? Uh, Most of this uh, is caused by an inadequate view of matter itself. We'll come back to that in a moment. But it it does puzzle many, many people. They get worried about the metaphysics of it all. And probably you and I are not going to be able to figure that one out. And you start... (laughs) You start thinking about, well, now, how exactly did the Holy Spirit, what did the Holy Spirit do to Mary? Did he create a ex nihilo, a little DNA there, and get the combination going, and how did that exactly work? Well, um, it's tempting to get lost in that, and, um, you know, efforts to understand the Incarnation have upset Christians, really, through the ages. There's about 13 different ways of getting it wrong that the church has recognized through the ages. They have long names, Ebionism, Gnosticism, we hear that one, Docetism, Monarchianism, Sabellianism, Manichaeism, Apollinarianism. Well, that'll do. That'll, there'll be a test on this later. <laughs> so, that'll do for now. But, uh, you know, we need to understand things, but the understanding 
And the theory is less important than the fact. And um, uh, we have to be careful and concentrate on the fact. And here is a much better expression on your sheet there. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Not counting their trespasses against them. You know, God does not regard sin as the last word. The last word is love and grace and forgiveness. And a way of dealing with all of that. And once again, I, I think if you believe you've got that one figured out on a theory, uh, wait until later and see. Uh, what happened in the atonement is something that is hidden in the depths of the Trinity. But the fact is there. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. And he has given to us, placed in us, this word of reconciliation. See, that, that's the fact. And Paul speaks of the mystery that has been hidden from the ages, which isn't just Christ coming, but Christ in you, the hope of glory. And he's speaking actually especially to Gentiles, that is to people who were thought to be out of uh, the possibility of God's blessing. And now Paul had learned that God's intent was for the whole world. And of course, actually, the Jewish nation was supposed to take this uh, to the world. And, uh, and they did. They just didn't do it in the way they thought about it. They did it in Christ who came to fulfill the promise that was made to Abraham that in thee and in thy seed all nations of the earth will be blessed. And so Jesus came. And now the word of reconciliation goes out to everyone. Whosoever will may come. Whosoever will. All you have to do is come. And you come to Christ. And you accept him. And then he lives in you. Now this is the wonder of incarnation. And the knowledge of Christ, of who he is, is what causes us to turn and to place ourselves in his hand. Uh, you know, basically, uh, the invitation of the gospel is based on the knowledge of who Christ is. And you proclaim the kingdom of God and you pray, proclaim the, hum, the humble king, as we sang a little while ago. The humble king. And you get a picture of what's going on. And that's the point at which you say, I don't want to miss out on this. I want to be a part of this. See, being saved is really a matter of participating in what Jesus is now doing on earth. It's not about what's going to happen to you later. There's a lot of good stuff there, too. But it'll take care of itself. Uh, the way you engage that is by participating in what Jesus is now doing on earth. And he's really doing something wonderful. And uh, there isn't a part of the world that he does not in some way touch. And the endless controversies about his nature and all of that give way to simple obedience, faith, discipleship to Jesus himself. Now, a lot of the problem in trying to understand the Incarnation is we don't have a high enough view of matter. And that's been a problem for humanity for a long time. Uh, that was one reason why the Greeks had such a hard time with resurrection. When Paul came preaching resurrection, they said, I don't want that filthy thing back, that body. I don't want that. They wanted to get out of the body. But, of course, matter is a good thing. You know, like they say, it must be a good thing because God made so much of it. Right? 
It is a good thing. And we don't understand what, ma what matter is, you see. That's what troubles people about the resurrection. They don't understand what matter is, or they wouldn't be troubled about it. They would understand that matter is quite capable of receiving God and all that is good about God. You know, uh, we've been on a project as human beings for a long time trying to figure out what matter is. And for a long time, apparently, the only thing we knew about matter was if you hit someone with, with, them, with it, it'll hurt them. <laughs> right. And then we discovered fire. That was a big breakthrough. I mean, what would we do without fire? Not so well. Now you can burn people as well as hit them with it. <laughs> that came a little later, I'm sure. But see, we're discovering what is in matter. And now, of course, we know that what is in matter is so great that we often wonder if we wouldn't be better off not knowing it. Right. So Oppenheimer, the one of the people contributing to the development of the atom bomb, was burdened all of his life with whether or not we ought to have done that. Well, I think actually in God's plan, we don't really have choice about those things. He's moving on and he constantly faces us with the challenges and we can be thankful that most energy is locked up in matter and we can't do much with it. We begin to, to work it loose. And, of course, when we begin to understand it, we understand there's an awful lot of power in matter. It doesn't look like it very much, but it's there. Just a few ounces of matter was, had enough power to destroy Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Just a few ounces. I heard one guy say less than an ounce, but, you know, once you begin to understand this, uh, then you're not surprised at much of anything about matter. You see, we have to have a greater view of matter. We have to understand that God, God made it and it's very good. There's so much power in it that, um, like a baseball, if you could get the atomic power out of a baseball, um, all of it, you could run an average car 65 miles an hour for 5,000 years out of one baseball. And there's some people been in the newspaper that recently that might have done better to get their power out of a baseball than <laughs> what they've got. Out of. <laughs> see, that's, see, that's one of the things about power is uh, that now it makes available strength to do things. And then what are you going to do? And that issue comes down. And Jesus comes into the world to establish a point of reference through which the power that is in the body can be used gloriously. And he did that, you see. And sometimes it broke through in his body. And that was a great testimony to the early church, not, uh, not just the resurrection, but also the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he prayed. And when you pray, you actually begin moving toward the greatest power on earth, what Frank Laubach called prayer, the mightiest force on earth, because it comes right to the heart. And... Uh, you know, it turns out that in the power that is in baseballs and uh, things like that, plutonium is actually mainly a matter of light. You know, the, the key to that is the, the energy in a piece of matter is equal to the mass of the piece multiplied by the speed of light. And light's very fast. You know, it can go around the earth. More than seven times in one second. You say 1,001. And you remember that the first act of physical creation was light. See, that's, you're getting close to the core of reality when you get into light. And it's not an accident that Jesus said that he was the light of the world. And then turned around and told some unsuspecting ordinary people, you are the light of the world. See, light is the key. 
to all of physical reality. And so now we have to think highly of matter before we can understand incarnation. And many people's trouble with incarnation is caused by they don't think highly enough of matter. See, Jesus is present in the material world in two ways. First, as creator, he created it. Under God, he's the instrument of creation. Without him was not made anything that was made. Back to the prologue from John that Bill spoke from last Sunday. He made it all. He's present in it through creation. But he's also present in it through redemption. And that is incarnation. That is where he comes personally now. Not just creating it out here, but now he comes personally and inhabits it. And that, of course, is what Christmas is sort of the opening doorway to. Jesus is now coming into matter in a different way. And that's incarnation. And uh, once you understand the greatness of what he's already done, then the fact that he could come now and redeem all of the physical world, because, you know, the passage we quoted from um, 2 Corinthians there at the head of your sheet says that he was reconciling the world unto himself. Not just people. And that's clear from the rest of the teaching of the New Testament, that he comes to redeem the whole world. That somehow the world is infected in a way that makes things go wrong. And it is, as Romans 8 tells us, uh, all of creation is groaning. And you can sometimes hear that uh, in many ways, no doubt. Creation is, why? Waiting for the sons and daughters of God to step into their role as, in the way Hebrews puts it, as brothers and sisters of the one who came first and who's led the way, you see. So he comes now in redemption and steps into the world in terms of flesh. Flesh is, of course, uh, physical matter. I guess if you were to knew enough about it, you could take my nose and blow up the world. You know? uh, I'm glad it's not, we don't know that yet. <laughs> Uh, but we're talking about flesh. Now, flesh is interesting. Flesh is matter, but it's not just matter. Flesh is actually uh, the social, socialized reality of human abilities. See, that's human abilities are almost totally social. And flesh is a great reality that binds us together sometimes binds us together in ways that are not good. But flesh itself is not a bad thing. You want to understand that. There's great misunderstanding. That's one of the reasons why we can't appreciate incarnation is because certain parts of our tradition teaches us to think badly of flesh. You mustn't think badly of flesh. Flesh is a good thing. And in fact, his spirit is going to be poured out on all flesh. Right? So you have to understand that flesh, one of our popular translations of the New Testament now treat, translates the word, the Greek word sarx, which is flesh, as fallen nature or sinful nature. It's a terrible mistake. Terrible mistake. Because where are you going to go? Get out of your flesh? No. That would be suicide. Right? And that's not a recommended way of be, being more godly. Rather, you learn how to submit your flesh to the Spirit of God. See? So your natural powers are good. As long as they are subordinated 
to God. When they are taken out of subordination of God, they go crazy. Because flesh away from God is just unvarnished human desire. That's all it is. And when you look at the battle between the flesh and the spirit, and I've given you references here, and I don't have time to go through all of them, but I hope you will. When you look at the references to the flesh and the spirit and what they do in Galatians 5, you'll see that there's a battle going on between the flesh and the spirit. Now, in the first instance, that's not the Holy Spirit that it's talking about. In the first instance, it's talking about your spirit. You have one. The human spirit is the human will. Now, take time to think about it, because uh, I, I really want to try to help you understand this issue of the flesh and the spirit and the battle between them. Flesh manifests itself in ordinary human life, apart from God, as desire. And that's why the scripture speaks of the lusts of the flesh. Desires. Lust is a colorful old English word. Um, it really means uh, sort of obsessive desires. Epithumia is the term that's usually used. It doesn't mean like you're thirsty and you'd like to have a drink of water. Right? So desire itself is not, but obsessive human desire governs life. And in human life, desire alone is always simply a matter of focusing on the object of desire. You see this in children. You take children somewhere and they see something they want. And they just turn into a want for that thing. Right? That's all they can think about. And you may try to talk to them. No, no, you know, if you spend your money on this, you won't have your money to spend for this. But I want that. <laughs> See, that's the nature of desire. That's why when it's left alone, it's so destructive. Because it's blind. It is, as Paul says in Romans, uh, I'm sorry, in Ephesians 4, he speaks of how we're in bondage to deceitful lusts. And lust is deceitful in a, in, a, in a simple way. It always says, I want that. And it just thinks about that one thing. The child just wants that toy. And you look at it and you see it's a piece of tinfoil and it will be broken in five seconds after it gets it. Then, oh, no, you don't want that. Oh, yes, I do. See, that's desire. Desire simply focuses on its object. And it's deceitful because it always says, Oh, if you just let me have my way, you'll be happy. <laughs> right? So, so someone says, I've got to have a donut. <laughs> no, you don't have to have a donut. See, that's, but desire says that. Right. And and uh, and uh, it doesn't contemplate alternatives. That's the nature of desire. And of course, you have many desires and they conflict with one another. They're chaotic. You can't satisfy them all. And if you try to do that and live by desire, you will wind up doing things that are wrong just because you want what you want when you want it. OK, now. Let me explain the difference then between desire and will, between flesh and spirit. Your will is your spirit. It's your power of self-determination. And will is not just looking for what you want. It's looking for what is best. The, diff the main difference between desire and will is Will contemplates alternatives. Desire says it's a donut, right? <laughs> That's it. That's what I want. And Will says, well, maybe you should have a V8. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then it presents other possibilities. Now, see, the will was made like that with God, by God, in each of us. And 
uh, he wants us to surrender our will to him so we will have a guide to what is good. Because he provides us with knowledge of what is good, and we'll have more knowledge if we surrender to that. If we, if we open ourselves and learn, and he will support us and enlighten us and empower us to do what is good. The, the, the problem for human beings is not so much that they don't know what is good and right. There are some problems with that. It's just that they want something else. Thank you. See, and now you look at Eve in the garden contemplating the fruit with her devilish thing looking over her shoulder. And what does it say? Well, it looked mighty good. And it, I believe it would taste good and it will make you smart. See, and now then, but she said, God said, don't do that. And then comes the tempter in and says, oh, no, 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 you know, you know, you know when you surrender your will to your desires, the next thing that happens is your mind goes crazy. Hmm? There's an old saying in Greek culture, him whom the gods would destroy, they first make mad. They go crazy. And you want to think about a lot of the craziness you see in our culture today, and it might make you think that we're on the way somewhere we may not want to go. Because the craziness comes, and, and it says things that are false and misleading in order to get us where God doesn't want us to be. And that will always involve an element of not doing what we want. You know, what the gospel brings to us is not what we want, but what's good for us. And we will want it later, but we don't want it now. See, that's the way that works. And when we surrender our will to our desires, then our mind goes crazy trying to justify doing what we want to do. And when we, in our will, surrender it to God, then our mind works beautifully because it takes in the truth. That's what truth does. See, if you have truth, you can integrate your life with reality. If your belief that your tank has gas in it is true... You'll do much better on the road than if it's false. Because reality doesn't say, oh, I see you were very sincere. Thank you. I, it doesn't say that. So the flesh now is not bad in itself, but the way it manifests itself is in desire. And I wanted to give you a verse from Peter uh, that is so helpful on this. This is uh, 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 4, 12. This is, uh, this is a, one of the most illuminating things you'll read in the Scripture. Listen to this. Therefore, since Christ has suffered in the flesh, arm yourself also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Would you like to cease from sin? There is a way. So as to live the rest of the time in the flesh. See, there's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly okay. No longer for the lusts of men, epithumia, desires of men, but for the will of God. Now, I, uh, I, I'm hoping you can take these references and really invest some thought in them because they will help you understand what is good and how to live for that. We don't hear enough teaching and preaching on these topics and we, we don't know what to do with desire. 
and we confuse good with what is desired. And so then, then of course, all of the good things, really good things, are lost to us because we're over here chasing our desires. And Jesus comes in the flesh, in the system of human desires that make up a world. He steps right into the middle of it, and there he does redemption. Flesh left to itself is a dreadful thing. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, Strive, jealousy, outburst of anger. Anyone ever hear of this? <laughs> Disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. Now, why? That's because people are driven by their desires. And if you're driven by desires, you are sure to be disappointed. And in your disappointment, you're going to turn to all sorts of stuff to try to get what you want. See? So the key now here is give up getting what you want. And you get much more than you ever dreamed. By turning your life through your will, over to the Spirit. Now, Jesus comes into this world. He's born as a little baby, steps right into the world of sin where the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life dominate. Steps right into it. Right from the beginning. Humble king. I love that phrase. Humble king. Now, he brings... The power of God into the system. And right in that system sets us free. Romans 8. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Now when you look, that's, when you look at the context, that's not talking about guilt. Guilt. That's saying there's nothing going on in there that's worthy of condemnation. Who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Oh, I'm hoping that just lights up for you now. And you see clearly what that's saying. You're not living to satisfy your desires. You're living to satisfy Jesus. To be a part of what he's doing. See? And you've come to see that your desires are going to be satisfied in a way that you can't even dream of. Now, we don't see it now. See, And if you hear presentations of the gospel that basically promise you you're going to get everything you want, you know it's wrong. It's wrong. You have no idea what to want in most cases. Right? <laughs> And that's the source of the chaos that leads to the works of the flesh. We want the wrong things. Our wanter has to be changed. And we surrender that to God and we go for what is good as best we understand it, trusting him to sustain us, to give us what we need. See, there's so much in life that you'll never want. And that's why it's important for you to surrender your self-will to God. Now, again, that is, will is not bad, it's good. Flesh is not bad, it's good. You have to have the order in it. And the churches have made such terrible mistakes by acting as if somehow uh, you could uh, just uh, be nothing. You know, oh, I'm nothing, nothing. No, you're something, something. <laughs> and God intends you to be something. He intends you to be something wonderful and great and good, and he will bring you there. No matter what your circumstances, no matter who you are, no matter where you're from, no matter what you've done, there are no limits to what he can do to bring us to an unbelievably wonderful place. He steps in where we are. 
He understands the flesh. He understands how subtle it is. Uh, I've referred in the notes there to the situation in the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 3. And that was a situation in which the people had got caught up into comparing preachers. And some were saying, oh, I'm of Apollos. Oh, I'm of Paul. And there was a specially holy bunch that said, oh, we're of Christ. Yes. And, but Paul understood what they were doing. They were comparing people in terms of human abilities. And that is, boy, could I ever tell you about a string of churches that have been crucified on that one because they went after someone that they thought was wow. And he was wow, except not in the way they thought he was going to be. So you can't, you have to look at it in terms of what God is doing through the person, not in terms of their natural abilities. But Paul said to the Corinthians, as long as you're judging this way, you're fleshly. That is to say, you're looking just in terms of human abilities, not in terms of the spirit. You might also look in Philippians 3 that I mentioned in the, in the notes there. Paul is giving how he follows Christ. And he says, if anyone thinks they have something to brag about in the flesh, I have more. And then he starts out with a list of human accomplishments. Well, not exactly accomplishments. He says, I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. And he didn't, I was circumcised the eighth day goes on down the list. See, those are the kinds of things you would put on your uh, curriculum vita if you're looking for a job. You put all these wonderful things. Were they bad? No, they were not bad. But as Paul said, in comparison to Christ, they looked like dung. That's pretty far down. But when you understand the glory of the incarnation in his people... You can see why Paul would talk about it in that way. See? So Jesus comes into our life, our world, and he steps into the realm of flesh where we live, and he begins to overturn the rule of human desire and bring to light the power of God. Deliverance. Salvation is deliverance. And we have deliverance from the way of the flesh. Listen to these things. Uh, this verse from, again, Galatians 5. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof. Now, crucifixion is an interesting thing. If you're crucified, you're not dead. But you're sure under control. To crucify the flesh with the affections and lusts thereof means that they are under control of the spirit, of what is good, of what is right. And in that capacity, then, they're okay, they're fine. Christ has come into the flesh and defeated sin in the flesh. See, that passage that goes on now from uh, in, for those who are in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation. They walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Goes on to say, for the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. All right now, I think we're on verse 4 there, somewhere about Romans 8. What the law could not do because we see if you trust the flesh, even the law can't help you. Let's see, if you trust Christ, then the law is wonderful. Yeah. So you, you, that whole passage on the flesh and the spirit in Romans 8 
is so important in understanding how redemption through incarnation works. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did. By sending the Son, His Son, in the likeness of sinful flesh. He put Him right in the middle of it. And for sin, or because of what sin was, He condemned sin in the flesh. That is, He showed up what sin really was by coming in the flesh and defeating it by the power of God. What that means simply is he didn't have to sin. One of the things that constantly misleads us is the idea that somehow we have to do what is wrong. Have you ever heard someone say business is business? What are they getting ready to do when they say that? (laughs) You know what they're getting ready to do. See, oh, well, we have to do this. See, when Christ comes... No more. You don't have to do anything wrong. See? And actually, the greatest way of stepping into the reality of the kingdom of God is to begin to do what you know to be right and trust God to take care of the outcome. Because, see, when I, when I, when I decide I'm going to do something wrong, that's where I've decided I'd better take charge. I'm in control. Well, now we're right back into the flesh when we do that. Now we learn to, now Christ came. He never found it necessary to do anything wrong. That's how he condemned sin in the flesh. He showed it up for what it was. And you know, when you, when you think about it, you, see, you, you can't imagine yourself sort of standing, wringing your hands and saying, Oh, I, I, I've got to give up lying. I just love to lie. It's such a precious treasure. No, no one ever thinks that thought, right? But they think, I gotta. No, you don't. See, now Jesus came into the flesh where all the bad stuff is running and lives through it triumphantly, goes to the cross which is the ultimate place of the surrender of the flesh to the will of God and comes through in the resurrection as the risen Lord. Now, learning to adore him in all of that, you see, is what we want to turn our minds to when we think about incarnation. And there are many dimensions of it. For example, You remember that when he gave us the Lord's Supper, as we call it, he used the language, this is my body. And what was he talking about? Bread. Now, when you begin to understand the greatness of incarnation, you may no longer need special explanations of what was going on there. Maybe he just meant bread. Hmm? Maybe he just meant bread when he said, this is my body. Now, when you begin to understand the greatness of incarnation, in creation, in redemption, you can be, and you'll never look at bread the same again when you do that. If you don't understand that, you're going to have to think up some special way that the bread becomes something it ain't. Right? So you have whole segments of Christian history devoted to that. And special people who have the ability to turn bread into flesh and explain why it doesn't taste like that at all or look like that. And then you have others who disagree with that. And no, not transubstantiation, but consubstantiation. The substance of Christ is present with it. And then you have the really timid souls like we Baptists, I, that's where I'm from, and they want to make it only something symbolic, an outward symbol of an inward grace. Well, you just about lost it all by then. <laughs> yeah. Maybe we'd better go back to bread. <laughs> and you see, you can do that if you understand 
that this is the cosmic Christ who is standing here and claiming all of it for himself. All of it. This is my body. You'll never think about bread the same once you begin to understand that. You see, that's Christ. He comes. He claims it all. He claims our life. He claims everything we're involved in. And Bill brought this out beautifully in his sermon last week, how that our ordinary life is the manifestation of incarnation. This is Christ in you, the hope of glory. But it's not a little bright spot down here burning somewhere that they'll check you out on when you go to the gate. It's your whole life. That is the place of, of incarnation. See, that's the mighty Logos now become personal and available to you and me wherever we are. And the things that we may not like, the things that distress us, are things that we can still submit to the Logos. And you know, you're never going to get what you want. Did you know that? Give up. Avoid the rush. <laughs> Quit now. Just accept it. See, that's the nature of human desire. And I emphasize again, it is not bad. See, that's the Buddhist or the Stoic that says, desire is bad, get rid of it. Well, you can't. And anyone who says they can, are just, they're just faking it. Instead of saying get rid of it, you say subordinate it to the good. Trust God who is in our world to bring it right. And, and there's, there's nothing wrong with not liking a lot of things. I don't like, I lost my last sibling a few months ago. I don't like this. I'm still grieving over it. He was a, quite a singer. And I've been just some songs that he used to sing, Christmas songs, have uh, come over the radio and, I don't like this, but I surrender to God. I don't like growing old. Not that I'm old. <laughs> I'm old, older, thank you. Um, see, there's a lot of stuff in this world that is designed, and the old saints all knew this, that's designed to pull us to the next world. And that is where we are being brought as we age. That process that has a lot of unpleasant things about it is designed to turn us to the greatness of Christ and the life that we are drawn to in him, for which this is only a very small prelude. It is a doorway into something. So now as we come to Christmas, Let's see, let's see Christ and his greatness. Let's remember how great he is and, and uh, let's draw on our scripture teachings. I, I, I like the passage in Revelation 1 where John has a vision of Jesus and passes out. Okay. That's what you do when you really get a look at this. And he mediates himself to us and gives himself to us in ways that we can move up on that. And, of course, if you move up on it too fast, it's always very scary. And that's why when an angel or someone shows up in the Bible, they always say, No, don't be frightened. <laughs> because you're scared out of your wits, you know, if you have to do that. So we gently began to see the greatness of God in his incarnation and how it covers the whole universe as well as us, and how God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and has placed in us the word of reconciliation. See, Now then, we can look at the Christmas lights. I love the lights. Glad they left them up. This star, I think, is pulsing a little bit. I had to look at it a few times. It's, 
I like that. It's got a little life in it. See? But, I, you know, I think we ought to just claim all of the beautiful things of Christmas. Just claim them. They're not bad. It's bad to be just focused on that and not on Christ. But once our focus is on Christ, then all of the good and all of the beautiful things, as well as all of the hard things that come to us, are just places to praise God. I want to recommend to you that you have a look at these last psalms uh, this Christmas and use them to help you celebrate. Celebrate the greatness of what has happened. And the just wonderful words here. The last psalms are, are all praise psalms, basically addressing the kingdom and how the kingdom is present. And I recommend that you try to get in a situation where you can read these out loud. And uh, now you might do that at the mall because, you know, people talking on uh, cell phones and they just think you're talking on a cell phone. <laughs> we used to think there was something wrong with people talking to themselves. <laughs> no more. So you might do this at the mall. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise Him in the heights. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all stars of light. Now you can walk about as you do that. You might even be tempted to dance a little bit. <laughs> Billy Bray, an old Methodist of a hundred and some years ago, uh, was a simple uh, lay preacher. And he was always happy. And he could hardly keep his feet from skipping. And he would say out of the blue, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And, of course, people always wanted him to shut him down. He said, if you put me in a barrel, I'd shout glory out the bunghole. <laughs> See, that's it. He's, praise the Lord from the earth. Sea monsters and all the deeps. I love the monsters. I love elephants. How can you not praise God when you see an elephant? I think of that whale, you know, that they run on the insurance ad. It's always jumping up and flopping over. I think every time he does that, he says, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord. Fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy, stormy winds, mountains and all hills, fruit trees and all cedars. Wonderful praise. The last psalm is where I think the psalmist just sort of runs out of wind and has to call for help. Uh, right? So he has a trumpet to help him. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. So you, you bring that before you. And you see, all, oh, this is God. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with a trumpet sound. Praise Him with a harp and the lyre. Praise Him with timbrel and dancing. There. Salsa. <laughs> right? Praise Him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Just crashing. Ah. Yes, praise Him with resounding cymbals. Ones that keep echoing after you whack them. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just sing the chorus that Leroy had us sing. Oh, come, let us adore him. Just slowly, meditatively. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, 
adore Him. 